chance to address this audience. And I want to especially thank the University of Nebraska and the conglomeration Humanities on the Edge who invited me to be here, and in particular Marco Abel, who was my point of contact and uh, the person who um, got me here. So since the late 19th century, immigration has been both hope and threat. What was once part of the warp and woof of nation building, part of the transcontinental movement of people to settle the United States, became simultaneously a source of promise and a cause of agonistic debate. Immigration law as a field of jurisprudence was born amidst crisis. At a moment in American history when the United States was acting the imperialist abroad and rejecting at home the Chinese immigrants who had been imported in order to construct the transcontinental railroad, immigration law had its foundational moment. The end of the California gold rush the entrenchment of European settlers, and a nationwide depression all combined to transform an engine of economic development into a threat to national identity. In the Chinese exclusion cases, the foundational cases of immigration law, the Supreme Court articulated a sense of peril, a sense of cultural peril. It was a precursor to the contemporary rhetoric surrounding the uncontrolled southern border. This strain of crisis rhetoric of the threat posed by immigration to national security and American culture has woven its way to the way that we understand immigration and shaped the policy tools we use to manage it. But the use of crisis rhetoric of this sort is not unique to immigration skeptics. A sense of urgency has also pervaded advocacy for expanded immigrants' rights. Urgent humanitarian objectives, the needs of migrants fleeing persecution or calamities who are at the border clamoring to be admitted, the sword of Damocles that is the threat of deportation from the United States, the human rights costs of failing to legalize the current unauthorized population, lead to the rejection by advocates of enforcement altogether, to the demonization of government power, and the rejection as racist of immigration skepticism. Business, too, traffics in this sort of rhetoric, drawing attention to the threat to American competitiveness that the failure to revamp our immigration system entails. So for immigrant advocates or immigration advocates generally, both those who advocate immigration at the highest field end and those who are interested in protecting the rights of the most vulnerable, the notion that the system is broken or dysfunctional has become shock -worn as has the idea that the future of our nation depends on expanding the routes to immigration, that our future as a nation is in peril if we cannot find our way towards a more open and generous regime of migration. This sort of heightened rhetoric serves a broad range of political purposes. For advocates, the sense of crisis can help galvanize social movements, and it can shine media attention on genuine problems and it can silence opponents. From the government's point of view, crises fuel the expansion of power, executive power in particular. And for the skeptics, crisis-based rhetoric, the rhetoric of peril, can help prevent immigration expansion, or at the same time reinforce the status hierarchies based on citizenship. But despite its utility for a number of different actors in the political system, debating in crisis mode also results in polarization and dysfunctions of its own. And the transformation of regulatory debates that ought to be ordinary debates into intractable problems beset by ideological differences that cannot be bridged even by reasoned decision making or reasoned deliberation. Governing in crisis mode often prioritizes short term thinking and obscures our need for lawmakers, reformers, and the general public to think systemically and with a view to developing lasting policy interventions, with a view to developing a sense of what all of this is for. In the immigration setting, the perpetual sense of crisis has often stemmed from genuine beliefs as well as actual, albeit anecdotal, experience. But it also has resulted in mutual recriminations and the politics of false promises that contribute to the elusive quality of lasting immigration reform and a rethinking of the system on which our country is based. Because of its existential quality, its essentially existential quality, its connection to foreign policy and the United States' place in the world, to these grandiose concepts, 
And because of this difficult to dislodge psychology that immigration is about a zero-sum game, the turn to crisis rhetoric and crisis narratives will be difficult to avoid and difficult to dislodge. And our political system, especially today, is such that we often need a sense of urgency to get the levers of government and policy making working, especially in times of divided government. But the hope, ultimately, should be to create spaces for the kinds of conversations from first principles on which any form of policy making, but immigration policy making in particular, depends. To think about the system that we want, rather than to address only the crises or urgencies of the moment whether that moment is a particular moment in time or an ideological moment. So in thinking about how all of these dynamics play out across the political spectrum and affect our political system, our capacity for policy making, I am using crisis as an umbrella term to describe not just discrete emergencies, moments of genuine crisis when the system seems to be falling apart or when there are large numbers of refugees in need of attention, but also a sense or a disposition of urgency, a raising of the stakes of the debate and towards the use of maximalist rhetoric and the invocation of peril as a way of framing a policy problem. Those who are in crisis or face peril may shift depending on the ideology of the speaker, but it is a style of argumentation that's common to our political debates generally, but I think particularly common to immigration debates, both today as well as historically. To see how this plays out and to think through what the costs are to our political system and what we might do to address these uh, dysfunctions, so to speak, I'll first talk about this in a bit more detail in relation to the way the border has been mobilized as a rhetoric in the production of crisis and in the production of policy controversy. Secondly, I'll look to the way that uh, people with a humanitarian orientation, those who are pro-immigration, use crisis rhetoric to identify the dysfunction and the harms of the system. Third, I'll consider the value that these rhetorics serve in a political system like our own and in our thinking through, as a general public, the issues associated with something as complex and multifaceted as immigration policy and immigration law. But then finally, we'll talk about the myopias that this crisis rhetoric enables and reinforces, the things that ought to be addressed in order to produce a better, more workable system. So the border, in some sense, is the original site of conflict, the original, simultaneously a metaphor as well as an actual place where conflict is understood to occur. It's been a site in particular for national security-oriented rhetoric surrounding immigration, both before September 11th, 2001, as well as, and in particular, after September 11th, 2001. So even before 9-11, advocacy groups ran ads linking the insecurity of the border, the porousness of the border, to terrorism and the threat to our existence as a nation. Many of the Republican candidates in the presidential primaries of 2000 called for border vigilance as a prime platform position. The Democratic platform of 2000 also invoked the sense of peril at the border and trafficked in similar crisis rhetoric, but broadened the sense of peril. It read, the current system fails to effectively control illegal immigration. It has serious adverse impacts on states and localities and their services, and on many communities and workers, and has led to an alarming number of deaths of migrants on the border, emphasizing the acute. Not surprisingly, after the events of September 11th, not only did a comprehensive immigration reform package that was on the table and being negotiated between the United States and Mexico get pushed off the agenda, but the heightened sense of the border as a site of crisis and as a potential source of peril to the United States became heightened. Then Attorney General John Ashcroft said, the ability of alien terrorists to move freely across our borders and operate within the United States is a source of threat. President Bush, in his 2002 State of the Union, highlighted the importance of stricter border enforcement to combat security threats. He invoked not just terrorism, though primarily terrorism, but he also began to invoke the threat presented by the drug trade. And the fact that the border is what protects us from the unspeakable violence that the drug trade has perpetrated throughout Mexico and Central America. In the immediate aftermath of September 11th, a great deal of security legislation was also enacted. New standards for identification cards, the Patriot Act that expanded the government's capacity to surveil, 
the enhancement of visa controls, the monitoring of enter entrance into the United States, the requirement that foreign nationals, particularly from certain countries that were predominantly Muslim, register with the government. Some of these were embedded in legislation that remains with us today. Others were temporary programs enacted by the executive branch. But the point is, is that the law enforcement machinery of the United States mobilized to deal with the threat presented at the border by the movement of people to prevent national security crises. In addition to that, subsequent to September 11th, the rhetoric of the border as out of control and the need for border security became <coughs> pervasive in immigration law parlance without necessarily having a focus on terrorism. It reflected a general rule of law orientation that has always been present in debates about American immigration policy, but that after September 11th gained increasing sense of urgency. That the border and its protection is no longer even principally about terrorism or keeping terrorists out, but about security more generally. The 2004 Republican Party platform emphasized ensuring the integrity of our borders as vital to ensuring the safety of our citizens. Politically, over the last several decades, it's been very easy in Washington, where it's ordinarily difficult to allocate resources, to shift large numbers of resources to enforcement and to the border in particular. The Department of Homeland Security is the most privileged agency in Washington, awash in appropriations. And as a law enforcement machinery, has more money and more personnel than the rest of federal law enforcement combined. In addition, the border seems to be the key to unlocking any other potential immigration reform. In a Senate bill passed in 2013, what was thought to be a template for potential comprehensive immigration reform, but that ultimately did not make it through the House, border benchmarks were the key to the other elements of reform. If it could be certified by the Department of Homeland Security that the border was secure, whatever that ultimately meant, then other elements of reform, such as the legalization of unauthorized immigrants, could proceed. But everything flowed from securing the border. And by securing, that meant ensuring that there were no unlawful crossings. Most recently, a bill that was introduced into the House not long ago called for the border to be as secure as the Berlin Wall. An astonishing metaphor to be used, uh, but an indication of the way in which the border has become this site for maximalist rhetoric. Even the Obama administration, which has attempted, at least politically speaking, to emphasize the targeting of its enforcement resources towards high-value targets, has made significant political hay from its emphasis on the border by shifting enforcement resources to the border, making it the most privileged site uh, in the United States, at least as far as the allocation of enforcement resources. Some of its objectives are purportedly humane ones in order to prevent border deaths and also in order to ensure that enforcement resources don't break up families inside the United States, but instead stop the threats where they come in. Ultimately, the visual image of the wall, and therefore of the border, resonates deeply with the sense of national security that has become interwoven into the way we think about the government as protector. The concept of the castle moat invokes the notion of a privileged space protected from invaders. In truth, the border itself as a source of insecurity and as a venue of crisis is dramatically overplayed. Apprehensions at the border are at a historic low for a variety of reasons, including the recession in the United States, as well as demographic and economic shifts in Mexico. And actual security threats don't stem from clandestine entry into the United States, and most intelligence professionals will tell you that it's intelligence work and not adding as many manpower, uh, man hours as possible at the border that are the key to, uh, to dealing with security threats. In that sense, the idea of the border is really a stand-in for a multifaceted idea about sovereignty and the sense that immigration imperils our sovereignty as a country. For many, the real threat comes from not the migrants who are trying to cross clandestinely, but those who are actually here. And the threat is a cultural one. It's not just a boogeyman constructed by right-wing ideologues, but it's about widespread fears that people have about the country's instability, the, the instability of the country's identity. The seeds of this concept of linking national security with cultural threat and cultural peril is in the Chinese exclusion cases themselves from the late 19th century. 
The idea that cultural threat can be a national security threat was woven into the court's analysis in its an explanation for why the federal government needs the power to control the border, something that's not actually in the Constitution of the United States. It explained that the Chinese in the United States were as much a threat as invading armies. The hordes of the Chinese who resist assimilation were threats to the very existence of the United States as a concept, if not as a physical entity. Today, uh, studies of public opinion polls suggest that even though there are a number of factors that get cited to explain resistance to immigration, especially unauthorized immigration, it is the threat of cultural change that resonates or appears most frequently. The notion that the United States is becoming something distinct as a result of migration. Not the economics, not the public safety impacts of immigration, but the cultural threat. The failure of many of the immigrants who are here presenting that threat to respect law and order by violating the limits on their entry adds to the sense of peril. Ultimately, this perceived threat of peril, whether it's cultural or national security oriented in the traditional sense, has helped sustain the rise of an enforcement behemoth, not just at the border as I've already described, but in the, in the way the system is structured altogether and the expansion of the grounds for which non-citizens can be removed from the United States to include offenses that are minor at best, and the use of coercive techniques such as mandatory detention and family detention in order to ensure that enforcement happens without interruption. The use of the sense of crisis at the border has therefore been mobilized over time and in our current political moment to create a coercive system that resists openness, but instead is about locking the country down. But this use of maximalist rhetoric, this use of a sense of peril, this use of a sense of <coughs> brooking no compromise, is not limited to those who find these narratives appealing or for whom these narratives resonate. It's also a form or style of argumentation found on the humanitarian side. For the immigration humanitarian, crisis also plays a big role in understanding the nature of both the way the law functions, but also in the underlying realities that push the law and structure the law. Since at least the early 2000s, as my reference to the Democratic Party platform suggests, border deaths by unauthorized crossers are used repeatedly to illustrate the folly of having border enforcement at all. The notion of deaths in the desert is something that's mobilized to resist the idea that there ought to be a wall or any form of resistance at the border. In addition, throughout the 20th century, and most recently this past summer, there are influxes of migrants fleeing a variety of calamities, whether they're political calamities, natural disasters, or pervasive violence, as has been the case in Central America. These crises reflect moments that demand government action, but they demand government action that respect the pervasive threat that immigrants flee, and that therefore cannot justify any form of enforcement or return of migrants who appear. For advocates, the immigration system itself helps to create or augment the peril that exists. It has created in their telling an ongoing humanitarian catastrophe. Immigration enforcement is described, therefore, in maximalist terms, in maximalist rhetoric, as creating a system that is in and out about human rights abuses. Other elements of social movements oriented towards immigration relief or opening up the immigration system also play on senses of moral urgency. For example, the so-called dreamers, the youth movement that has gained notoriety by emphasizing the injustice of unauthorized immigrant youth who were brought to the United States through no choice of their own, having no path to status in the United States, traffics in a kind of moral urgency and moral outrage. Their claims are based on a sense of how dare the United States not respect their right to remain and their entrenchment in the American political community. The movement that uses not one more deportation as its slogan similarly challenges government power from its very foundation, rejecting the legitimacy of enforcement altogether, suggesting that the system itself is so infected with injustice that deportations at all uh, must be stopped. In addition, the failure to legalize the unauthorized population constitutes a crisis of conscience 
as well as a policy crisis. And the injustice of it, again, uh, leads to the refusal to enter into coalitions that might result in legalization programs that provide half loaf as opposed to the entire loaf. For the Obama administration, this form of critique has mostly been stated in the terms of a broken system. It's a rhetoric often employed that the system is either broken or dysfunctional. The way it was described, for example, in the 2012 Democratic Party platform was that the system separates families, undermines honest employers and workers, and leaves millions of workers in the shadows. Rhetoric of concern. In addition, the rhetoric of national survival is used to justify either a critique of enforcement or a call for immigration reform. In 2013, President Obama said, I'm here because most Americans agree that it's time to fix a system that's been broken for way too long. Now is the time to do this so we can strengthen our economy and strengthen our country's future. Our national survival depends on getting this right. For the administration, this sits alongside some of the martial rhetoric that the border enforcers also have employed. And even some immigration, immigration supporters propound this kind of rhetoric about putting boots on the ground at the border. But for them, it's a trade-off. You put boots on the ground at the border and identify the source of the problem, and then perhaps open up space for greater openness and other elements of the system. This administration's shifting of resources to the border on the theory that that's where emergent threats are plays on the notion that there are points of crises and other places where um, more openness can be tolerated. So the notion that crisis or moral urgency or peril exists in the system of immigration is mobilized by both sides of the debate, often from their points of view in effective ways. And there are a number of positive elements that this introduces into our political culture and into the debate over immigration reform. At the strategic level, the benefits are obvious. Crises can help set a policy agenda, and there's a rich social science literature about the way in which crisis serves as an agenda-setting function. Particularly in a world of limited resources and limited attention span, the articulation of crisis can help generate public support for policy change. Absent some sense of urgency, it's hard to justify the allocation of scarce <coughs> resources or the marshalling of effort by a body as unwieldy and problematic as the United States Congress. Crises can also be exploited by reformers, but they can be meaningful catalysts to change. Many of the major pieces of social legislation throughout, the American, throughout American history were the product of or responses to disasters. So for example, um, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act of 1938, which was a major piece of regulation, was the result of a series of food and drug epidemics throughout the United States. The Refugee Act of 1980, which finally incorporated international law standards about refugee status into American <coughs> law, and created a system for granting asylum that has become one of the more generous systems in the world, was in development for a long time, but like immigration reform today, was stymied in committee and never made it to the final stages of the legislative process until the refugee crises of the late 1970s after, this, uh, after the Vietnam War from Southeast Asia made evident that a crisis required a response and the Refugee Act was in, in large part um, emerged from that response. The downside, of course, of this um, legislation in the aftermath of the crisis are the statutes that I invoked before, enacted immediately after September 11th. Rapid reactions to crises can leave us with regulatory apparatuses that are designed to respond to crises, but that otherwise give the government too much power and lead to the rigidification of rules that no longer seem necessary after the media crisis has passed. But in the main, disasters in particular, but general senses of crises, have been effective in enabling major social legislation. The other important value of using crisis rhetoric or creating a sense of moral urgency about one's political position is that it can enable trade-offs and compromises in the legislative process. So this is the gamble that the Obama administration is probably playing, which is to say that by throwing what might seem like useless money at the border, it could result in new and greater openness in other elements of the system as well as making gains on the side of immigrants' rights. 
So by acknowledging the, the point of view that, that expresses the sense of crisis of the other side, legislative compromise becomes possible. Crisis rhetoric can also serve as a framing device for important debates that clarifies uh, the poles of a debate. It can have a crystallizing effect in the political process. And this is related to the notion that people's attention spans are limited and therefore crises can help direct that attention in a productive fashion. The border trope and the use of the sense of crisis at the border serves as a recognizable stand-in for resistance to immigration. And for those who have deep-seated reasons for resisting immigration, using the rhetoric of threat is a way of advancing that political objective, a way of advancing that position and crystallizing debate around the need to recognize that. Pitched rhetoric forces us to grapple with these sovereigntist concerns as ones that must be engaged. The public, in general, is disposed against, pre, uh, disposed against the expansion of immigration. And therefore, the use of rhetoric to bring that to the fore is a way of engaging deep-seated underlying public interests and values. On the flip side, uh, crises can serve as a method for galvanizing social movements. And some of the immigrants' rights social movements I've already invoked have used the rhetoric of crisis to great effect that has actually had significant impact on the policymaking process. The activism of the dreamers that uses this language of moral urgency, of injustice, and of peril was born of a sense that those who were brought here without any choice of their own, but have no path to status in the United States, are in an intolerable condition. And that sense of moral urgency and rhetoric of second-class citizenship over time has built pressure on the Obama administration in particular to do something about it. <clears throat> And the administrative relief that he has undertaken over the last several years to provide some measure of relief to that population is directly linked to the power of that social movement that has been generated in large part through the kind of rhetoric that it has used to make an impression both on the public and on the president himself. Another way in which immigrants' rights activists have used maximalist rhetoric to positive effect from their point of view is in the way they have forced a reevaluation of enforcement agendas that the federal government has increasingly been relying on over the last several years. There's a policy by which when someone is arrested at the state or local level, <coughs> that information about their arrest gets communicated to the federal government. The federal government then requests that state and local police hold the person who um, came up as a positive hit in the system. This has generated a considerable amount of controversy at the community level because it creates a sense of distrust of the police. If every interaction with the police can result in potential removal, then interactions with the police ought to be avoided. From the law enforcement point of view, this is a serious problem because it, it disables law enforcement for, for, from performing its public safety functions. Advocates seeing that this presented a problem to law enforcement use maximalist rhetoric to explain how this would destroy the capacity of police to ensure public safety in their communities. Not with a great deal of evidence, but with a great deal of fear behind that claim. In addition, advocates have used the rhetoric of the new Jim Crow to describe the way that certain states and localities have responded to unauthorized immigrants. Again, escalating the debate to a point where it becomes morally problematic for anyone to support what states and localities are doing because it's linked to the old system of Jim Crow. But what these advocates have accomplished using this kind of rhetoric has been significant. Even if it hasn't led to a dramatic shift in public opinion on immigration, it led the administration to revamp its enforcement policies in a way that ultimately should have uh, benefits for immigrant communities. It led governors and mayors of states to say to the federal government, we don't want you enforcing your immigration law in our communities because it's destroying them. And it's the advocacy of the, uh, the rhetoric that, that the advocates have used that have enabled that connection. The idea of mixed communities in crisis and the threat of the breakdown of institutions, though probably dramatically overstated, is what garnered the attention, first of state and local lawmakers and then ultimately of the federal government. So the use of this maximalist rhetoric, the use of a sense of peril in crisis to describe either what immigration means as a threat to the United States, or what the system of immigration enforcement does to the people of the United States, has borne fruit 
in the form of money, in the form of time, in the form of policy reform. But I'd like to say that the use of crisis rhetoric ultimately is destructive in our political system and has turned the immigration debate into one of polarized ideologies where there's very little space for lasting compromise. And there are a number of myopias that crisis rhetoric enables, both generally speaking, but also in the context of immigration law. So crises can be easily manufactured. Things that might have some element of truth can be turned into something that stands in for the truth. And they're manufactured to serve ideological agendas. Precisely because of the way in which crisis rhetoric focuses public attention and unlocks the keys to resources, policymakers' time and uh, fiscal energies get distracted by them. And as a result, they're very easy to use to, to garner that attention. But the result is mistaken beliefs, mistaken beliefs about what's actually at stake in the world and the compounding of a problem that is central in human psychology, and that is the overvaluation or the overestimation of risk. The perception that something that presents a risk on an anecdotal level presents a risk on a general level. The failure to do a cost-benefit analysis of enforcement measures, or the failure to put the impact that certain enforcement policies have on immigrant communities into some kind of larger perspective. Reinforcing <coughs> existing beliefs as opposed to illuminating the state of a regulatory domain. In that sense, the use of crisis rhetoric makes good policy making difficult. Perhaps more important, crises can obscure responsibility. In contrast to the argument that the expenditure of federal funds <coughs> takes a disaster, the unforeseeability of crisis and the need to address extreme consequences can also obscure underlying accountability. What do I mean by that? So rhetoric that suggests that either an act of God or forces outside of the control of the United States have resulted in certain consequences can let policymakers off the hook. So we can take as an example the most recent refugee crisis, so to speak. In the summer of, 20, of 2014, thousands of unaccompanied minors and women traveling with children began to appear in larger numbers than usual at the southern border, mostly in Texas. There was a record surge of Central American migrants, mostly youth and women, traveling with children. In the media, the primary culprit for this crisis, as it was framed by both sides of the political spectrum as well as by the media, was the overwhelming gang violence in Central America that they were fleeing. But as scholars who have studied the underlying dynamics of migration from Central America emphasize, this emphasis on the crisis precipitated by violence in Central America obscures American responsibility for creating the structural conditions that produce that violence and produce the migration that may be in part a result of that violence. Structural conditions that were created by the United States during its interventions in Central America and the Cold War, as well as its <coughs> complicity in the expansion of the drug trade through the creation of demand for the drugs in the first place. And by emphasizing this as a moment of crisis, of external events that have created this unusual surge, the debate obscures what's actually behind the uptick in, in movement from Central America. In addition, the concept of a border crisis as a whole, one that's been deployed by Republicans and Democrats <coughs> alike, obscures the United States' responsibility and participation in creating that so-called crisis in the first place. Again, the rhetoric suggests it's a problem from without, much like the Chinese hordes or the Chinese exclusion cases were a problem from without. But it's conditions in which the United States is complicit that have created that problem. And identifying it as a crisis obscures that fact. Social scientists fight about what exactly the source of unauthorized migration has been over the last several decades. But the integration of the United States with Mexico, labor market demands in the United States, our own dramatic under-enforcement of the law in order to serve U.S. labor needs, as well as uh, people's political agendas, have all contributed not to a crisis per se, but to a long-standing dynamic that's built up over interactions over many decades. Framing this as a crisis, therefore, results in thinking about immigration as something that happens to us, rather than something that we participate in creating. It removes a sense of responsibility from the immigration debate, 
And in many ways, this absence of a sense of responsibility and the emphasis on what can we do to make America stronger has impoverished the debate and, and set the parameters for a, a limited form of immigration reform. Using crisis rhetoric can also harden positions and thwart compromise. I suggested earlier that it might be a way of trading off things in the political process. But the way in which it's been used in the immigration debate, I think ultimately has had the effect of polarizing the debate, of hardening the positions on either side. The pitched rhetoric that has been used could, to be sure, reflect underlying policy disagreements, deep underlying policy disagreements. But by framing new immigration or a failure to steer, seal the border as a threat to national identity, as, a, as an ex existential threat, or to frame border enforcement or enforcement as a whole as morally unjust or as itself illegitimate leads to a position in which there can be no compromise or two positions that do not overlap. Finally, the use of crisis rhetoric and the framing of activity as, uh, or the framing of policy domains in crisis terms has the effect of expanding government power and executive power in particular. This is a particular source of concern of mine as a constitutional lawyer and scholar. And it's a mixed bag, this question of the way, the way in which crisis expands executive power and the power of the president. In general, proponents of strong executive power actually identify this as a benefit, that you need an executive that responds with alacrity and speed to events. And many events that happen, happen quickly and are in fact genuine crises like the financial collapse of 2008 or September 11th, 2001. <clears throat> but the downside of this expansion of executive power and the reliance on the executive and the need for speed to address policy problems is that it eclipses the legislature and a fully aired public debate. By pushing increasingly Congress out of the picture, it undermines the notion that the branches of government ought to act collaboratively. And it's through that collaboration and a multifaceted public debate that the best policy results occur. So some examples of the use of crisis to expand the power of the executive include the way that the Obama administration used the crisis in 2014 of unaccompanied minors from Central America to expand its power. On the one hand, commentators described what was happening at the border in that summer in terms of inhumane conditions. And the president was able to use that rhetoric of crisis and inhumanity to somehow get $3.7 million of appropriations from Congress to address the problem. He played up the violent crime, abuse, and extortion that unaccompanied children in particular faced as they relied on smuggling networks in order to escape conditions in Central America. And yet, the crisis was also used to justify forms of enforcement that even those who are immigration skeptics might find problematic. Things like family detention, summary process, removal without ordinary procedural <coughs> protections. So humanitarianism and the emphasis on security combined in this instance to create a policy response that was driven by the executive without a considered debate about the underlying purposes of uh, the underlying um, sources of the crisis and a long-term solution to the crisis. So ultimately, the focus on the extreme in our political debate can obstruct efforts to develop a coherent theory of the underlying policy domain, whether it be immigration or some other policy world. The focus of security is the beginning of the end <coughs> of the debate. The fear of a system out of control blocks meaningful deliberation about what we might replace it with. At the same time, the rhetoric about the system being unjust or being itself a humanitarian catastrophe blocks debate about what our theory of immigration enforcement ought to be. So the question ultimately is given the number of dysfunctions that arise from the use in our political debate over immigration of the rhetoric of peril, of the rhetoric of crisis, what is it that can be done? In a fast-paced policy environment, it can be difficult to carve out meaningful space for deliberation about first principles. Lawmakers, agency officials, advocates tend to address the last battle or the most recent failure of the system, but seldom do they engage in sustained discussion of the overarching purposes the system should serve. 
And in some sense, this makes a lot of sense because it's hard to do that when policy problems are flying at you at a rapid pace. First principles discussions are difficult to have, even in an environment when you don't have a million emails to answer and multiple government agencies to contend with. And those discussions can waste the precious resource of time. We often work within the structures that we have to address problems as they arise instead of recreating those structures on an ongoing basis. Modern media culture exacerbates this tendency towards emphasizing the moment and ultimately the extreme towards emphasizing peril, risk, and danger. And well-known cognitive biases also lead us to overemphasize risk, as I've suggested, and therefore to be compelled as human beings by crisis narratives, those narratives that conform to our underlying ideological preferences. But there are a variety of ways to improve decision-making so that it is less events-driven and takes into account longer time horizons. To overcome the deliberate manipulation of crisis and the rhetoric of fear in particular to make decision-making more clear-eyed. First and foremost, and most abstractly, uh, there ought to be a tendency towards or a default presumption of skepticism of crisis rhetoric on the part of the public when it's mobilized by media or public officials or even activists. The key to this is the teaching of critical thinking skills and the application of critical thinking skills. The capacity to understand what statistics actually mean and to understand that anecdotes don't make necessarily general trends. The content and nature of our political culture depends to a large degree on the existence of these critical thinking skills among citizens and it's in the hands of voters, consumers, and readers. Secondly, and more concretely, there are a number of institutional design strategies that could be used to improve the quality of decision making. And this is where the lawyer and the technocrat really can come into play. There can be ways of institutionalizing deliberation, both at the public level and within government, when dealing with emergent situations in particular, or when dealing with intractable public debates over policy issues like immigration. When laws get enacted in the aftermath of a crisis, like the Patriot Act or other similar laws, the technique of putting a sunset into the law is a way of ensuring that whatever one thinks at the moment of crisis is necessary for the government to have as a form of power doesn't last longer than the emergency, or that there's a moment when the country is not in an emergency to think about whether that power needs to be authorized. And some of the laws that were enacted after September 11th did include these mechanisms, but they're ones that should be more um, and more common. We might also borrow techniques from other constitutional democracies that have emergency powers, but then procedures for revisiting judgments made using those emergency powers after the fact. A process built into the legislative process itself or into the executive branch itself that requires a reconsideration of steps that were taken either in an actual emergency or to under the umbrella of emergency. More generally, when we're not talking about crises, actual crises themselves, but instead this general predisposition to using crisis as an ideological cudgel, uh, we might, in these instances, recommit ourselves to the concept of a vigorous and insulated civil service as a counterweight to the political motivations that use crisis to obscure and use the rhetoric of fear to advance political agendas. Here, we take a strategy from the New Deal and inject some technocratic expertise into the debate about the underlying policy issues. Immigration in particular could really use this kind of thinking precisely because it is based in emotion, a lot of the debate is based in emotion, and because it touches on fun issues of fundamental concern, not just to uh, law enforcement, but to the American people as a whole. But injecting cost-benefit analysis, technocratic and insulated forms of decision-making, decision-making that's independent from the political process could actually lead to uh, the production of space for the first principles kinds of conversations that are sorely lacking in our immigration debate today. So finally, when it comes to immigration reform, and this is true of many policy debates, but it's especially true in this setting, I believe, some de-escalation of rhetoric on both sides might serve the cause of ultimate reform. Nothing about the reform measures that have been on the table in recent years will make or break the future of the country. Immigration does not present an existential threat, nor is it the salvation for the United States. 
American political culture in general, and the immigration debate in particular, play host to extremists of various sorts. And most sides of the debate come to their conclusions based on general beliefs, preferences, and worries about the future. But by recognizing the quotidian alongside the extraordinary, we might actually get closer to a better regime and to a system of immigration lawmaking that better approximates the highest ideals of the United States. So with that, um, I'm very happy to open it up to questions that you might have. Yeah, we certainly have time for questions. Uh, I'm, I'm somewhat interested in, in, in you maybe uh, talking a little bit more about what, what, what you would see as kind of a, a more technocratic um, solution, like building more kind of government agencies. I, I mean, in some ways, government agencies can be just as prone to uh, creating crisis to kind of perpetuate themselves as kind of the, the, government, the government itself. I mean, I, 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 I think about kind of our various drug enforcement agencies. In some ways, they constantly rely on reinforcing the danger of drugs to the public uh, to, to kind of maintain their existence. And, and there's plenty of experts uh, in there that will cite numerous numbers and, and statistics to kind of support their case. So, so I think that, there, that that point is very well taken. Um, and there is a strain of political science thinking that emphasizes the way in which agencies uh, to ex seek to expand their own power in their domains. And so everything that I said about the utility of crisis would apply in their day-to-day -day behavior. But what I would say in response to that is that there are ways of structuring government agencies and ways of imposing requirements on government decision-making that can at least offset that. It wouldn't be a panacea, but it was a way of offsetting those tendencies. So, for example, the way the immigration system is structured today, decisions about how many and what types of immigrants can be admitted to the United States are made by Congress. They're set in the immigration code, and they're decisions that don't get revisited on a regular basis, in part because of the difficulty of legislation, but also because of the intractability of this particular issue. The result of that has contributed or has included the rise of unauthorized immigration because we have a set of preferences that don't match the demographic and economic realities of the hemisphere. If you had a government agency that had some independence from the political process and you created it in ways that insulated it from the political process that had the authority <coughs> to adjust numbers and types of people who could be admitted to the United States, it would be more closely tied to larger political, demographic, and economic dynamics, and less to political preferences. The, the critique of that is obviously that somehow the people should be in charge of deciding who gets to come in and who doesn't. But the difficulty of having that debate and the way it's gotten polarized, I think, is a reason to give it to at least some element of the decision making to government agencies that are insulated from those kinds of dynamics through institutional design. Another mechanism that is largely absent as far as I can tell from immigration, immigration policy making, but that's required by law in other domains, is that any new initiative go through a cost-benefit analysis. And that can be done by an office in the White House. It can be done um, keying off of the Congressional Budget Office's estimates of various things. You can design it to put it in whatever institution you want. But it's a, a requirement that any new initiative of a certain size be studied in that fashion, at least as a way of producing information that could then be better or less well disseminated, but that could still be disseminated as a way of informing the debate. That still requires that people in general understand how uh, to make sense of cost-benefit analysis or statistics. Um, and so it's always going to be a politician's interest to obscure that. But the thought, at least, in the requirement that, that, that exists in other domains, that the production of that uh, what the thought that that would have is that it is a way of producing information that can help discipline decision making. It's not perfect, but um, immigration is sorely lacking a lot of the technocratic um, elements that other domains have that I think can be used to great effect. Yes? Um, so you mentioned at one point that, um, you know, like the current rhetoric surrounding this issue allows 
um, the U.S. to kind of dodge its own responsibility in creating the situation. <coughs> and so I'm just kind of wondering why, or is there maybe even a push to do more of the, I guess, vital work in actually fixing these situations? Because to me, it sort of seems like current policy is to try to put band-aids on a person who needs like surgery. Mm -hmm. And why would that not be taking place, or is it taking place? And would part of the problem there is it just like cheaper right now to do the things that we're doing instead of addressing the larger issues? Or is it another, does it create another fear of national security in terms of like making these countries more financially stable or politically stable? Does that somehow seem as even a threat to our own national security? Because right now we're kind of, you know, the big fish in the pond. So I think the, a lot of the elements of your question are partial explanations. There are a lot of, we all suffer from cognitive limitations. And so it is difficult when you see a particular problem to try to figure out where that problem comes from or what the underlying causes of the problem might be. It's much easier to address the problem as it arises. And when you have a political system that's pulled in a million different directions where it's difficult to decide how to allocate limited resources and where you have so much divergence between the parties on fundamental questions, it's difficult to move beyond addressing discrete crises that people believe need some band-aid solution, but there's no patience and time um, or even possibility of meeting of the minds to address the underlying problems. I also think that in the case of immigration in particular, <coughs> addressing the hemispheric dynamics that have historically been responsible for creating migration networks and are behind the way the issue manifests itself in the United States requires imagining the United States as part of a larger world. And I think American politicians are, are congenitally predisposed against that. Um, and it, there, it's kind of, there's kind of a national predisposition against that. And that's not related so much to a uh, sense of crisis, though it may be related to the sense of exceptionalism. The United States lives in a state of exceptionalism. Um, and, but I think that that is a significant factor in why it's been difficult to address underlying dynamics. Now, in the case of migration from Mexico, um, shifts that the United States may have had some responsibility for participation in are actually resulting in the dramatic decline of unauthorized immigration. The expansion of the middle class there, the aging of the population, um, both of those factors, economic and, and demographic, mean that unauthorized immigration has slowed to nearly zero from Mexico. Um, it's not the 1990s anymore, but we're now dealing with the, um, the lo long-lasting effects of the migration of the 90s and the early 2000s. Um, so in that sense, um, the problem may sort itself out, um, but without acknowledging that the, those long-standing effects that the United States currently has to deal with are the result of choices that the United States participated in making, sometimes not consciously, it's a series of accretions of legislative decisions, trade deals, um, and just long-standing ties of, of people cycling in and out of the United States and across the border, but without a recognition of that, um, then I don't think that you're, you're going to get a full reckoning of responsibility um, the United States has for addressing the problem and how it ought to address the problem. Yes, here. Um, refer to Supreme Court like, decision or discussion about like Chinese mm -hmm. Question might be too broad, but I wonder what your take is on more recent Supreme Court rulings or decisions related to immigration. If it's if it's continuing this rhetoric of crisis and kind of perpetuating with the earlier cases, or have any comments yes. on the recent Supreme Court? <laughs> so I think that you do see that strand of existential peril in some modern Supreme Court decisions. When the Supreme Court says whatever process Congress gives immigrants is the only process they're due, and suggests that the Constitution doesn't otherwise restrain 
Congress. That stems from a belief in the authority of the political branches to protect the United States from uh, assumptions based in national security and foreign affairs um, responsibilities that the court believes Congress and the president to have. And so it's not nearly as overt as it was in the late 19th century in the Chinese exclusion cases, which were written at a time when the United States was fighting the Spanish-American War and um, could openly resist the notion that certain peoples were just not capable of assimilating in the United States. But what I mean by this rhetoric being a product of and also reinforced by a complicated set of views about sovereignty, um, that is present in modern Supreme Court decisions. The counter trend to that, though, I think, is that a lot of the Supreme Court's jurisprudence in immigration law has become technocratic in the sense that it's about interpreting the statutes that Congress has enacted, which are highly technical, and doing it in a way that keeps the government honest. Um, when the government tries to use um, ambiguities in the statute to advance government power, the Supreme Court on numerous occasions in the last decade has found ways to resist that. But it's been through a very lawyerly kind of exercise. Um, and in some ways that helps to illuminate how a more technocratic approach that holds government power accountable to the way the law is written and to a set of procedural requirements um, that the law erects can actually be a way of, um, of holding government to account and preventing, um, preventing government power from expanding, whether it's because of these underlying beliefs about sovereignty or the government's just general desire to maximize its power. Um, so I think you see both the court trying to bring that immigration power under control through technocratic lawyerly decision making, but also um, this underlying sense that some of these fundamental decisions about whether mandatory detention or exclusion of certain types of immigrants, what have you, are permissible, are decisions for the political branches who have control of the limits of our sovereignty to make. Yes? You explain the, the current problem largely around the rhetoric crisis, but typically the rhetoric of crisis is used by leaders to raise anxiety, to create a consensus around action. Is it really what's underlying this is the reason it's different is this is, it's, it's a crisis, I understand they're using maximalist rhetoric, but more importantly it's a wedge issue that each party is playing to a different set of voters around this issue. So it's not a crisis that allows the leaders to create consensus. Rather, it's a crisis that allows them to divide the electorate for their own benefit. So it seems more about wedge issue politics than just the rhetoric of crisis. Yeah, I, I agree with you that the way that it operates is to stymie action with which the person who's using the rhetoric disagrees, so to prevent a legalization program and to stymie um, maximalist enforcement measures or to get the administration itself to reformulate its enforcement policies. Um, but I, I think that um, it's, it's not so much a wedge issue, if by that you mean it's a way of drawing clear lines in the political process and advancing a larger Republican agenda or a larger Democratic agenda. I do think that the rhetoric used on both sides is based on actual, sincere, and genuine beliefs about the relationship between immigration and our security and our future as a country. It's just that the way in which that is debated, I think a debate that people genuinely feel needs to happen, um, undermines that.